Zambia Blog Talk Radio. I bring you greetings from College Station, Texas. My name is Dr. Henry Kasonde Musoma. I am so, so very excited to invite you to the first, I mean, the first ever Shifting Mindsets to Ignite Growth Conference in Livingston, Zambia. This will be held from July 6th to July 8th. Please go to shiftingmindset.org and sign up. We look forward, we look forward to make the waters Thunder, Macedonia. See you soon. Hello, everybody. Good morning from Dallas, Texas. This is your host, Nathan Inkama. Thank you for joining us from whichever part of the world that you're watching us from. Please. Tag a friend, tell them we are on the air and about to go live, live, live here with a very uh, dynamic discussion, the dynamic guest. We're going to be looking at national issues and how Zambia's political outlook is as it is at this moment of eight to nine months of the UPND government uh, being in power and a lot of other political issues that are trending in our country, economy, and all those kind of things. Those of you that uh, keep sending me messages and asking to say, please send me a link and all these things, this is the easiest way to do it. We are on Facebook, Zambia Block Talk Radio. Like and follow the page so that when we go live, it will give you a notification that we are live. And on YouTube, for those of you that are not on Facebook, it's ZBTR TV. So just like and subscribe, and it will give you a notification that the show is now live. All right, let me welcome my co host here as we get ready for a great discussion. Mr. Mashonga, good afternoon. How is Zambia today? Good morning, I'm good, Nathan. Zambia is warm. Um, it's not as cold as we've been complaining about. <laughs> uh -huh. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're looking forward to a discussion with Dr. Mumba? I'm looking forward to our uh, discussion. He's quite enthusiastic, so I'm excited. <laughs> All right, let's get into it and waste no time since we have a lot of matters to discuss and cover with our guest uh, this morning, afternoon, evening for those in the Western Pacifics of Australia and those parts of the world. We are going to get into it. Uh, joining us today, is uh, one of Zambia's leading uh, political leaders, Christian leaders, and great minds of Zambia, is no stranger to the show, a former vice president of the Republic of Zambia, founder of a renowned world uh, a ministry, uh, Victory International Ministries, and is currently the MMD of Movement for Multi-Party Democracy, uh, political party in Zambia, Dr. Nevas Mumba. Dr. Mumba, good afternoon and welcome to the show. Well, uh, Nathan, thank you so much for having me, uh, Mr. Kasula, uh, Kasuluba. Yes. Um, I know you're in Zambia, but uh, it's great to have you on the show and I look forward to this uh, discussion today. Yes, sir. Uh, Roger posted something on social media on your on a promotional flyer we were doing about you. He just said, welcome home, Dr. Mumba. I think uh, we appreciate your support and your consistency and always being there for us whenever we call upon you for our past 14 years of doing this show. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It's been an honor to do so. Let's get into the discussion. We have a lot of ground to cover here, Dr. Mumba. Uh, are we going to presume that the MMD is still part of the UPND alliance? And uh, if so, how are things going? How much consultation is really going on? 
Well, first of all, um, let me make something clear that uh, for us, it's a partnership with the uh, European League government, uh, more yes. specifically those of you that have followed the history of uh, the relationship between the movement for multi-party democracy and the UPND, but more specifically, my relationship with the current president, um, President Hakai de Hichilema, has been that of being in the opposition for 10 years together, the last 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. battling for New Zambia, battling for a Zambia that opens up the liberties for everyone. Um, and also to ensure that the challenges that we've been going through uh, as political parties uh, are dealt with. So we have common ground with the UPND, uh, not starting now, but for a long time. And so our decision to uh, join hands in partnership uh, comes from the fact that we have common background and common aspirations for the country. So yes, when it comes to uh, consultation, uh, because of this ongoing relationship and friendship that has been you know, between the two of us, um, we are privileged to be able to speak into their thought pattern uh, on the ideas that they are rolling out. Uh, if we have any question, uh, we have a direct line to ask as to why government wants to implement such kind of a, a position. So yes, to agree with you, um, we are doing very well. We are working well together. But I must also mention that there is a difference between our relationship with UPND and what they are calling the alliance. Uh, okay. We don't belong to the alliance of political parties that work with the UPND to get into government. We, uh, this is a new uh, partnership that we have entered in which we are supporting uh, from the bigger picture, the direction that UPND is taking, which are in agreement with our bigger picture of ensuring that the rule of law is restored fully in the country, that the fight against corruption is viciously and effectively done, and to ensure that the image of Zambia internationally is cleaned up because that is currency on its own, and uh, to make sure that the debt burden that Zambia carries, mm. uh, which we had anticipated to be about $30 billion when I said it in 2017 and I was fought, we have now found out, yes, we do have a mountain of a debt, and we agree on with our friends on how we should dismantle that debt. So there are many areas in which we are supporting our colleagues and we're working together to ensure that we deliver uh, what is really um, workable for the Zambian people. Okay, so to make it very clear to everybody watching, listening on the radio side of this discussion, MMD is not part of the alliance. You, you, you just have a good working relationship or partnership with UPND and you have open communication lines. Is that right? Yeah, it's a position that both of us have established, but within the next few weeks or days or weeks, we are going to um, make another announcement that is going to sort of define how uh, we are going to move forward. So that I will not touch because okay. I will have to wait until I'm given the opportunity to make the announcements. All right. What's the direction the MMD as a party is taking? Where is the party headed? Well, first of all, um, allow me to use this opportunity to make two statements. First of all, I'm not going to go into all the details as to what we are going to do, uh, because mm. as I've already mentioned, uh, I'm going to face the media in the next few days, uh, okay. if not a week or so, in which I'm going to announce to the nation on behalf of the National Executive Committee what we are about to do as an organization. Um, but it is also important to note that um, people need to understand the state in which our party has found itself. I'm mm. not young anymore. As president of the MMD, I've been fighting for 10 years uh, to keep this turbulent ship on the waters, to cross the opposition waters that have been very rough for MMD being in the opposition for the first time. So there are certain things that happened to the movement for multi-party democracy that really injured its very outlook, its okay. electability. Um, it affected people's um, feelings and attitude towards the party, regardless of who is in charge because of the developments that have happened. First of all, those of you that are old enough remember that in 1996, 
um, after just being in power for five years. Mm -hmm. MMD it went into a situation where Zambians felt that we mistreated the first president, Kenel Kaunda, uh, arrested him, uh, stopped him from running for an election in 1996 election. That was a big dent on our party. And I think that a number of our problems began from there. Fast forward five years later, we had another problem, and the problem was the third term debate that really punched holes in the credibility of our party and the, the appeal that the MMD had in 1990 started to be lost because of the debate of the third year that the I mean, third term that the president, uh, Frederick Chiluwa, uh, was uh, wanting to get. So that in itself created a crisis for us. And those of you that remember our performance in the 2001 election reflected that. Um, mm. Never in the history of our country has any president won with 29% of the vote. And for, unfortunately, that's all we got. And Anderson, Mazok, and UPND got 27%. Um, and that was all because the Zambian people started to withdraw their credit from the MMD uh, as a result of that third, uh, 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 third term debate. Let's fast forward. Mm. We fast forward to 27 with all these things into account under President Rupia Banda. We lost the election now, the general election, because the Zambian people felt that I think we've had enough of this. It is the time that I was brought in after the failure of our party to win the election and uh, the despondency in MMD and the anxiety of our membership. We came back, brought a lot of excitement. We started to win by elections. And if you allow me just to finish two more minutes, I'll be through, but I think it's mm -hmm. important to lay this groundwork because you won't understand what I'll be saying. So when I came back from uh, Canada's High Commission and got elected as the president of the MMD in the opposition now, um, it was an excellent victory because I got 70% of the vote, uh, national vote from our party. And the idea was let's get someone new who is not really part of this thing that has been going on and give hope. And that hope came because the few by-elections that followed after that, we actually started to win them because of that excitement of a new leadership uh, and new prospects. Uh, but we were hit again with another uh, setback. Uh, the mm. former president decided to come back into politics and stand after the death of President um, uh, uh, Michael Sata. Now, that in itself was such a big breach politically that the party was now split into three. One group remained with me, one group went with President Rupia Banda to, U to PF, and one group that was really wanting to move on, moved to the UPND so that they can start afresh. That's where you get the likes of President, I mean, uh, Finance Minister Musokotwane now, the Chituos and the different ones who said that this breach in MMD cannot be corrected. So mm. we remained in that state. And as though that wasn't enough, after that, there was a big fight for those uh, who had gone to PF, who want to take this party to PF. When we resisted it, it became a problem because they were in power and a lot of stuff happened. Now, the reason I've given this background is to let the Zambian people know that the decision that we are going to make in the next few weeks is going to be a drastic decision because the current MMD has mm. been so disfigured in the eyes of the Zambian people that unless we do something drastic to it to sort of reshape our political advance, uh, we'll be getting the same results. And um, after all this, we were in court for four years which means that we couldn't function, I couldn't function as president until in 2019 when we finally won the case in the high court, tried to restructure the party. It was too late for 2011, for 20, uh, 2021. And uh, the results are there to show how injured our party has been in the process. Even us as individuals look injured um, in these long fights we've had. Having said that, I am glad that our National Executive Committee has now made a decision that we are going to take such drastic steps as mm. are necessary to become part of the process of transforming this country and using the values that we have always carried to contribute to making sure that Zambia becomes the country that we all aspire to see. All right. Sorry for taking so much time, Nathan, <laughs> but I appreciate you giving me the opportunity because sometimes we don't say these things because you want to be politically correct. But that is the story of the MMD. 
No, it's important for you to say that because, like I mentioned to you, that's one of the questions that uh, was sent to me uh, when we we talked when we we we, we publicized your coming onto this show to say uh, he's, he's gone quiet whenever he appears on the media platforms. He's simply singing praises for you, PND and HH, and he's not talking about his own party. It's important that uh, you have uh, a, a, a ex, a explained that. Uh, Kasulova has got a follow-up question on that. Thank you so much, Uncle Nathan. Um, Dr. Mumba, welcome once again. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it, it is good that you actually ran us through the history of Zambian politics, uh, in particular the MMD, because it's actually very important. Um, a number of issues that you have raised being from 19, let's say 1996, you've talked about um, wanting to, the time that President Kaunda was perceived to have been ill-treated. You've talked about wanting to run for third term and a few other issues. There have been some Zambians who have made mention to say some of these things or rather some of these issues were dealt with when um, the late Levi Patrick Manasa came into power. Because then some of the issues, let's say corruption, allegations, those that were found wanting were tried and, and they went through the legal process. And after which um, the economy again um, sort of stabilized. Zambians had confidence in the party during that time, there was issues of NGOs being rejected. That was under the MMD, um, inflation and other things. Um, all that were quite manageable. Um, don't you think that there was the disjoint came in after the demise of um, the late Manawasa? Because after Manawasa died, President Manawasa died. That's when now uh, other issues sprang up. So during the regime of um, the late Rupia uh, Banda, there were some issues here and there and complaints came in. Isn't it when maybe MMD lost ground? Well, thank you so much. Let me just be clear. Uh, this is not an overnight development where MMD lost ground in a moment. The reason I've given you the history is for you to appreciate that this thing did not happen overnight. It's, a, it's been a build-up. From mm. the moment that we had the third term debate, mm. MMD has never recovered. Um, President Mwanawasa, his own moral standing kept MMD on the string of survival. And you must remember that he was not a popular president. President Levi Manawasa became popular after he left government, when they now looked back and saw what he had achieved. But during that, I was his vice president, and I know what I'm talking about. He was not liked. He was being vilified. And, you know, they only started to talk well of him after he died. So I think that, um, keep in mind, he only won the election by 2% above Anderson Mazoka. So he was not a popularly elected president. So MMD at that time had already lost its uh, flavor, if I were to use that word. When he won the second term of office, that was basically because President Michael Sata had ignored the western part of Zambia. Not western <clears throat> part of Zambia. He didn't have anything to do with it. He only concentrated on the northern. Otherwise, if President uh, Sata had gone to the other parts of the country, we would have lost the second term for... Um, you know, um, Levi Manwasa, who was, by the way, quite sick at that time. So I do not think, yes, it is true that when President Rupia Banda came, um, you know, it only got worse because the people now decided, okay, uh, Levi is gone. This party was was going down anyway. So, and these are certain things that MMD is doing now. Let's abandon them. And that's what happened in 2011, that for the first time ever since MMD got into government, MMD was kicked out of government. So for me, every negative contributed 
to making the story of MMD unfortunate. So I cannot even put it just on Rupia Banda alone. Mm. Yes, it did contribute in one or the other, but I think that the history I've given you weakened uh, the movement for multi-party democracy and made it less attractive in the eyes of voters. Mm. Okay, excellent question. We, we've already, you can see that the time has already gone and we have a lot of things to talk about. Let, let, let's move on to the to the uh, the fight against corruption in our country, Dr. Mumba. Uh, it tends to take the same format. You, it's like we wait for the government in power to lose the election, then it pounce on them that were in power. Are the agencies entrusted with fighting corruption instruments to pay? Uh, is this just about persecuting political opponents? Our, our, our fight against corruption is questionable, Dr. Mumba. I don't know what your view is. Well, first of all, we have made it very clear. Like I've said, we're in partnership with our colleagues in the European, and we support uh, President Hakainde's desire to, uh, to you know, clean up the country uh, in this regard. But we have also made our position very clear that if mm. we are going to fight corruption in the same style that we've been using over the past number of years, we're going to get the same results. And the results are not effective results. We have made it very clear. We have to depart from the old way of fighting corruption. First yes. of all, we think that there are many reasons why it looks the way it does look. Number one, we are using the same way of fighting corruption. For instance, you go call somebody, you take them to, to the police, they get uh, worn and cautioned, and they are released on bond, and they go out there, then they keep going to court. And the time that they are going to court and doing all those kinds of things, we have two other problems. Mm. The SEC members of staff, and a lot of them, a number of them are not people that are committed to the fight against corruption. And uh, you must understand when people are in government, they have a lot of money, a lot of money. So by the time they are getting out of government, they are very scared of being locked up. And uh, if an official that is part of the fight against corruption is uh, given or shown that money, very few of them can execute their role uh, as um, you know, investigators or people that are going to prosecute uh, those cases. So I think that we have a problem of corruption within the SEC itself, mm. uh, which we must make sure we clean up uh, so that it becomes a system that can deliver on behalf of Zambians. Number two, I think that we have a problem with the manner and the length of these cases because these people have time to go and abuse our judicial officers, the um, the magistrates and judges. Uh, they are also human beings. And these people, remember, have a lot of money. So while the case is running, they're able to go to their homes and go and deliver trunks of cash uh, to make sure that their cases are not... Um, no, uh, properly adjudicated. These are facts that we cannot run away from. That's why a lot of cases of rich people, plunderers, and corrupt people do not succeed because they're already backed. They got money, and uh, the judges don't have as much money. They are struggling. You know, the people at SEC don't have much money. They are struggling. So we have to make a, a foolproof fight against corruption. So mm. that story we have given you makes it very difficult to use the current regime of the fight to change anything. We have proposed, on the other hand, that we need to, do, to, to renew the law and strengthen the law in terms of, you know, if our proposal really is something that President Haka in the touched and he was not ready to go there, uh, it's a question of saying that, look, today Never Smumba is not in government. After five years of being in government, today I've got $30,000, that's what I'm worth. After yes. being in government for five years, I'm worth $3 million. All we need to do, if, I, if, you know, if we were to advise as we have advised, if there is suspicion that whatever they have are proceeds of crime, you take them and put them in jail and sort them out from there. Because if you keep them on the grounds 
it mm. becomes very complicated to manage those cases. But that needs to take a law. If a law is not enacted, this porous way of doing this matter is going now to look like persecution, which is true. Yes. That's exactly how it looks, Dr. Mumba. And please enlighten us. Which law are you talking about here? What, what, what needs to happen? Revised? Completely right, a different law? What needs to happen? Because we have to, a law there. Uh, we have to insert a law there. For instance, look, the right thing to do when you are dealing with, it, with criminals mm. is not to give them too much space and too much time to mess with evidence, to run away or to twist paperwork or to buy people responsible. You have to move in immediately on that line of the law, which says that, you know, if you suspect someone has got money or things that are proceeds of crime, that yes. in itself is a case. But you must insert another law that once those people are arrested, um, they are kept away for a period of time. Like, for instance, in Angola, I think, or another country like that, where they actually put them away for 90 days to deal with them so yes. that they can decide whether they tell the truth to government, where they got that money. And if they are truthful, then uh, the court case goes in a certain way. If they're not truthful, they remain in jail for the rest of their lives. You've got to decide, do you want to fight corruption in reality? Or are we going to be going back and forth? Because what we don't need to do now is to make the criminals look like victims now. The moment you cross that line, you have lost the fight. Yeah. The moment the, the criminals begin to look like victims, you have lost the fight against corruption. And we are now urging our colleagues in the UPND to make sure that we don't have this thing go to that level. We need to move in, get results as quickly as possible. That's why the crime um, court has been, uh, the, uh, the, the, been established in order to hasten the process of uh, prosecution. And I hope that we can get that done. So yes, I agree with you, Nathan. We need to insert some law there that keeps them there while all this stuff is going on until the truth comes out. It's shouldn't harsh, part, of, it's shouldn't the part of the process, and uh, maybe the other way to ask this next question is, why doesn't the nation receive constant reports on the fight against corruption throughout our daily lifetime? Not when a political party, when the, gov the guys in government lose elections. Shouldn't we just be receiving periodical reports, Dr. Mumba, from you know, public institutions, colleges, and parastatos, and government departments. I mean, not to, to pick on any particular individual. All of us know what, go, what goes on at the lands department. You wonder why the issue has not been addressed. I'll give you a perfect example. You, you know this. I always wonder, why is the university one year behind? Tasuluba, you remember I asked you a question and I said, yeah. you finished just for arguing. What year did you finish? Did you graduate high school? 20, 20, high school 2011. 2011, and you went into university 2013, right? Yes. 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 You see, we have a situation, Dr. Mumba, where young somebody was accepted into UNSA. Now, quite an acceptance later on, one, Dr. Mumba. He goes for registration and the child is told it's full. What do you mean it's full in quarter acceptance letter? So, <laughs> I mean, okay. so please address this. Why don't we get periodical reports on the fight against corruption, not just when the government in power loses elections? Well, first of all, thank you. Very, very important questions there. But let me um, cut it into two. Number one, mm. let me deal with the question, why don't we have periodical reports from all the different sectors of society and, uh, um, you know, to, to hasten this? That is in place, uh, Nathan. It's there. That's why we have, there's a, there are auditors in all sections of the government. Every mm. institution of government is under the watchful eye of the Auditor General. And they also have their own auditors, whether it's Ministry of Lands, whether it is um, uh, the schools uh, in education, whether mm -hmm. they are all 
the auditors are there to make sure that they manage those things. They are actually, at the end of the day, supposed to be reflected in the Auditor General's report. It's at this point of the Auditor General's report that the Zambian people are let down almost all the time. Because a lot of cases that appear in the Auditor General's report are prosecutable. But yes. very few of them are prosecuted. And that's what the European government must now work on to ensure that those reports that are coming uh, through the Auditor General's uh, report are dealt with and people are held to account and people are jailed for them. That is the only way that corruption levels are going to be reduced. So to answer your question, there's no need to replicate this. Maybe we need to strengthen the process of audit uh, in order for it to reflect everything that goes on but mm. also just to have the culture that hates corruption so that people, we have more whistleblowers than we have at the moment. Um, but I can assure you that the system of government has in place a process that makes sure that every section of government is under audit every year. And where we fail to function is we don't prosecute people that are found wanting. That's number one. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other question that you asked that I had wanted to answer, I think it has disappeared from me. Uh, I spent too much time on this one of the Auditor General. But let me answer it that way, that there are systems uh, in government that are provided in with this matter. Okay. Mm. Kasulova has okay. a follow-up question on that before we take a break. Um, wonderful. Um, talking about the, uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission, Dr. Mumba, Many Zambians have called them incompetent. If so, why do you think this is the case? Is it due to understaffing or maybe lack of resources? Uh, understaffing, no. Um, I think I've already touched this. The problem with SEC, first of all, you must understand, let's just be current with the SEC problem. Mm -hmm. This is the SEC that watched the current cases that are being taken to court, they were committed under the same SEC, but they took no action. So the question is, what's the problem? The problem is they were compromised. Mm. They could not prosecute because of some reason that either they were afraid of the government in place, they were afraid of losing their jobs, or they were afraid they were being paid off not to prosecute those cases because a lot of these corruption cases in Zambia, Zambia is not as big as the United States where you don't know what's happening in California, you don't know what's happening in Florida. Zambia is 18 million people. And mm. the people in government, we have 23 cabinet members. We have, you know, so many permanent secretaries. It's not like a huge thing. So Zambians watch their lives. They can see corruption in the public uh, leaders from, from, from a distance. This guy becomes a minister today. He was on the streets without shoes before he became minister. Now he has got seven GX vehicles at, at the house, two Mercedes-Benz cars. He's building three mansions in New Kasama. You don't need rocket science to know that this guy has touched somewhere. And that somewhere is from government or opportunities that he has seen in government. That's why I'm saying that we need to fight this fight differently. Get them, throw them in jail, let them sort themselves out there and prove their innocence from there. And those who are innocent will be gotten out. And those who are, if you don't do something drastic, this will be a funny fight which will turn into, it will make criminals become heroes. And that yeah. happens in a very short time. And we really don't have time. We are losing time. We need to move quickly. So in terms of staffing, I think they do have the staffing, but I think they compromise a lot. And mm. I'm happy that they're starting to get changed. And we just want to say to the new staff that have come to SEC, don't do what your colleagues did so that when the current members of government that are there today, uh, if they become corrupt or any one of them becomes corrupt, you should never keep quiet because in the next government, not only are they going to be called to account, but you also will be called to account because you enabled those things to happen. This is where we are. And that's really what we are fighting. That's what 
our colleagues, you know, um, have had the discussion with President Aga in HLM on this one, and he agrees with me that we really need to make sure that we clean up from where these guys uh, left and mm -hmm. allow people that are capable enough to run this process of the fight against corruption. Excellent. We'll continue our discussion with Dr. Mumba as let's take a commercial break here. I bring you greetings from College Station, Texas. My name is Dr. Henry Kasonde Musoma. I am so, so very excited to invite you to the first, I mean, the first ever Shifting Mindsets to Ignite Growth Conference in Livingston, Zambia. This will be held from July 6th to July 8th. Please go to shiftingmindset.org and sign up. We look forward, we look forward to make the waters thunder. Masutunya, see you soon. Our guest this morning, uh, afternoon, evening, depending on where you're watching from, is Dr. Nevers Mumba, is MMD president, and uh, we've covered quite a lot of ground. Uh, if you missed the show, you can listen to the recorded podcast on our YouTube channel, ZBTR TV, on Facebook, Zambia Block Talk Radio. Um, one of the things, Dr. Mumba, that a lot of people are so upset about is there's literally no form of accountability on the toll gates collections and yet most of the roads are still in a deplorable state um i, I don't know what your comment on that is i mean because people are bragging the previous regime and what really baffles me is the bragging that goes on even from zara we've collected so many billions of taxes and so many what, but it's not showing. It, it's not showing. It, it doesn't reflect in the nation to say they collected so much. So my the business people should stop going through that ditch road <laughs> leading to Mukambo border post. It, it's not reflected. What's the issue with the targets? Well, I... I'm one of those leaders or politicians that really understand the small issues, but I also understand the problem Zambia is facing. It's bigger than the target issue. It's bigger than mm. potholes. Um, and in, each time we change government, we have an opportunity to do the right thing. You see, the problem with Zambia is it's not just a question of fixing the target revenue and apply it properly, as simple as that is. We have failed to do that over the past number of years since target um uh, you know uh, idea came into this country we have failed mm -hmm. to manage that to translate the income from the target into doing new roads or keep improving the same roads on which we are paying the toll for we don't do that and therefore what is broken is not the collection of the targets money what is broken is the system what Zambia needs, the new government needs, and this is really our advice to our colleagues in government now, the same people over which President Edgar Lungu presided over mm -hmm. are the same people President H.H. is presiding over. The same mindset, the same behavior, the same attitude. So it doesn't matter whether you put the son of God, you put someone, not let me not let me remove the son of God. Let somebody who really is strong, pure to lead the Zambian people, they yes. will still not succeed until this mindset of the Zambian we invest in it through small things, Nathan. How can you change the mindset of a nation? How do you know that Zambia is disjointed? The signs of the money from the targets not being applied where it should be applied is just a sign of the problem that the country has. Mm -hmm. They brag about receiving so much money through ZRA, but the services, the goods and services are still the same. Yeah. You go out there on the streets and look at the filth in Lusaka, uh, it's still the same. People still do 
all the terrible stuff on the road, they spit on the road, they, the road is the toilet, and we are trying to get you know, money from the IMF or anywhere in the world to inject it in a mindset that is dysfunctional. The Bible says, do not cast pearls before swine. What it means is, make sure that when you're bringing something precious, mm. whether it's an idea or it's resource, you work on the mindset of that which is going to receive it. The problem we have in Zambia, we need to invest in the mindset of a Zambian. For instance, how do you know? Kenneth Kaunda, whose uh, funeral, I mean, whose memorial we were dealing with yesterday, yes. did a few things to deal with this matter. We, we used to laugh at him. He started to inculcate certain cultures in the Zambian body politic so that we all start to have a culture, first of all, of being gracious and kind to one another. If you have a funeral and mm. the, the cortege is driving by, all of us stood at attention. It looked yes. like we're in a communist country. What that was, what KK was doing was to bring humanity out of us, that mm. we are family, we are brothers, and we are safe. That's what building a community and the country is all about. In, you go to other countries, you spit on the ground, they arrest you, you pay a fee. You yes. urinate outside Cairo Road, they arrest you. It's those things that they start to manage you so that your mindset becomes a responsible mindset. What we have in Zambia today is that the money that is coming from the target is being abused with very little accountability because we are a disjointed, indisciplined group of people that does not follow the regulations that we set for ourselves. And this government must ensure that they enforce the law to ensure that anybody who fails to account publicly pays for that misbehavior. It's the only way we can correct this situation. I am of the opinion, Dr. Mumba, I was telling a, a friend, I said, uh, Zambia can live within its means. Zambia can live within it, its means with... Uh, the, the, with the tax revenue that we receive, uh, toll gates, all those collections that are done at the border, when people come in with imported stuff, and I don't even know how this Africa free trade area is working, whether it's been implemented, but uh, that that's that's a story for another day. I want us to change the subject to mining here, uh, a very big subject with a little time that we are left, and then I'll probably read one or two questions. You saw that commercial I ran about. You recognize the gentleman in that video clip. There is a conference coming up in, in Livingston. I'm surprised then we can speak very good English, you know, the Chinsali people. Oh, come on. He's a professor. Come on. Give him a, give him a breath. I'm, sh I'm shooting at him. Let's listen to this video clip and then I'll ask you one or two questions. Good afternoon. My name is Damian Williams, and I am the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. The criminal charges filed against Glencore in the Southern District of New York are another step in making clear that no one, not even multinational corporations, is above the law. The scope of this criminal bribery scheme is staggering. For more than a decade, Glencore cheated the free market to gain a competitive edge. Glencore paid over $100 million in bribes to government officials in Brazil, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Venezuela. The bribery scheme here spanned the globe. Glencore paid bribes to secure oil contracts. Glencore paid bribes to avoid government audits. Glencore paid bribes to judges to make lawsuits disappear. Why did Glencore do it? They did it to make money, hundreds of millions of dollars, and they did it with the approval and even the encouragement of top executives. And as we allege in the charges filed today, Glencore tried to cover up the bribery scheme with code words and bribes paid through third-party consultants. It didn't work. Because Glencore ultimately could not hide from the prosecutors at the Southern District of New York and the Department of Justice. Let that, that video, I know you've watched that before. Um... Glencore this, Glencore that, Glencore that. Uh, Dr. Mumba, should the Zambian government terminate the contract between Glencore and ZCCM? All right, this is how it works. Uh, 
Nathan, before you consider any investor to mm -hmm. play a role in our economy, it is expected that due diligence is undertaken to ensure that a full background check is put in place. It's not Glencoe's job to uh, investigate themselves uh, and to do due diligence on, the, on themselves. It's the Zambian government that has to make sure that they check every aspect of their credibility and the fact that they are a genuine enterprise that would add value to the Zambian economy. Mm. Now, at the point that Zambia feels that Glencoe can now be admitted within the economic system of our country by participating as investors, they tie themselves to contracts, development, uh, uh, development uh, uh, contracts that we draw up, and we tie ourselves in that regard, which means that contract will have to run. Now, in the event of the clip that we have just watched, yes, uh, Zambia, based on that clip, uh, cut the arrangement with Glencore or any other company for that matter that has been implicated either in the United States or Brazil or whatever, as that thing runs. The arrangement is that if that company breaks the Zambian law, then Zambia will act to ensure okay. that either terminate that or, you know, because they are broken Zambian law. Um, we are not able to do an investigation in Brazil as to whether these guys actually did that or not. I think the way it works is that Zambia must be more serious with their due diligence before any international um, company is allowed to participate in the Zambian economy. The moment you do a contract, of course, you still can break the contract at great price because then you are going to have to pay them for you know terminating a contract that you've signed. So it's important to make sure that you do your due diligence effectively before you commit them. But to answer your question, based on what you know, we are watching from California on how they have accused the Glencoe to doing that, we can't use that as a basis to act against Glencoe here because okay. Glencoe has to break the Zambian law for us to deal with them. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I agree with um, Dr. Mumba, and also what 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 I I thought of saying was um, as regards the due diligence. Yes, like you have rightfully made mention, it is imperative. But then it does happen, uh, even in companies as well as at, at the national level, where you haven't obviously um, been able to gather the the entire information. Maybe mm. Zambia. Yes, Zambia needs to carry out, conduct due diligence, but then Zambia is not at the level, let's say, of the U.S. The U.S. might be able to get certain information that um, Zambia might not have. But then what's important is for the nation now to make sure that the dealings are, are, are right, not so. And... Yeah, look, I'm not saying that um, you ignore what uh, has been reported about them. Look, we have a situation going on right now as we speak in Zambia concerning mm -hmm. uh, Lab Green and Zamtel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Zamtel was, you know, uh, sold to Lab Green under certain circumstances. Uh, when Mr. Michael Sata came, he felt that it was, you know, certain considerations were not taken into account, just like you have put it, that probably the MMD, when they were doing that, they did not look at all the other you know, uh, pieces of information. So Mr. Sata comes and breaks that contract. Up to this day, we owe 500 million kwacha. No, no, I think it's more than that. It's close to $200 million on that breaking of the contract. Money we don't have. So all mm. I'm saying is that we've got to be careful. We cannot use our lack of capacity to interrogate the operations of that it would be investor as a reason why we are going to lose 200 million dollars no we can't use that if we are going to deal with the big boys and bring them into our economy we must consider ourselves as big boys also to be able to do the due diligence we, we can't have it both ways so for me we do we are not excused from doing what the united states is doing over glencoe we should do the same thing they are doing if we want glencoe to participate 
you know, economy. Mm, excellent. Wonderful. All right. Um, shifting away and focusing, looking at the Black Mountain now, uh, it has been seen over a, a couple of um, days, weeks, uh, or is it months, that the Black Mountain is proving to be more of a death trap as opposed to be an empowerment uh, program for the youths. What um, comment do you have over over this? Should it then continue, or then what measures 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 rather should be put in place? We have made again our position uh, known on this issue. Uh, first of all, you must understand that uh, the Black Mountain was a problem uh, to the safety of our young people even before the UPND came in. Um, mm. No, it, 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 it was a death trap even then. Our position is that we do not really agree that we get the Black Mountain and give it to the youth so that they are empowered generally like that, because that's a major security trap. And, you know, it's, it's a dangerous project. Uh, even when you drive by it in Kitwe, you can see potential danger there. I mean, these guys don't have the equipment. They don't have the... Um, the, 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 the attire that they put on, the safety attire that they can use. It, it's, it's a deadly engagement. Our proposal is that that Black Mountain mm. should be given to established companies that are going to be advised that they hire the young people so that those companies are held accountable for the safety measure. You can't just go to Chamboli and pick up 200 young people who are have no money, they are suffering, and say, now this portion is yours, that portion is yours, the five of you. They, they are going to use their hands to do. They have no science. They, 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 have, they are not engineers. They do not understand that if you keep digging down there, that thing will fall on you. As simple as that is. A lack of education is that dangerous. They cannot calculate. You think when you went to school, uh, Nathan, and studied their physics and, and all that, you thought it was a joke. No, they were trying to tell you that if you keep digging here, and this is here, and mm. people will have that advantage to fall on you. So they don't have that background. So our insistence is we need to pull back and have a conversation with the young people, and then ask for companies, credible companies, that can provide the safety equipment, that can provide the equipment to use in order to get the, 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 the metal out of that stuff so that it is done in a way that our young people are protected. If we don't do it, I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, but very soon you are going to hear some more young people that are about to die. And we can avoid that by mm. pulling back first and study this thing afresh. Are we going the right direction? And I, I would like to submit we are not on the right path with the manner in which we are going in terms of safety. Mm -hmm. Two more questions on the diaspora from our colleagues, and then we shall wind up our discussion. We had a lot of things to talk about, but time is not with us. Uh, what is, this is one of the questions, it's about the diaspora from uh, one of our good friends. What is your view on diaspora engagement and any recommendations for the nationals and diasporas? Uh, what would your government have done for the diaspora? Well, first of all, I think we need to resolve one issue, uh, and we need to go in biblical times or in history. When we talk about the diaspora, first of all, let's agree that these are our nationals. Mm -hmm. They are Zambia working in a foreign land, trying to achieve some goal for their families in a foreign land. In the process, their eyes are back in, on, in their country. If they have to send any money, uh, when somebody dies, their parents are in Zambia, they'll send the money here. If they're trying to buy a little farm for their uncle, they'll send the money here. We have everything to benefit from our diaspora. And therefore, we must be very careful that in the manner we treat them, we should not disadvantage them from the opportunities that other Zambians have here. We lose nothing by ensuring that the same opportunities, whether mm. it's acquiring uh, of land, whether it's uh, 
being able to rush back here if there's an opportunity of a better job for you to come and be able to be integrated. It should not be the way it is now, where there's a big division. These are diaspora. We are the Zambians. There's nothing like that. I have always insisted, when I was High Commissioner in Canada, and I spoke to the diaspora, I made it clear that that is your country. I don't even care whether you have a Canadian passport and then you have a Zambian nationality. I don't care. You are still a Zambian. At the end of the day, your the countries that have succeeded or become rich are countries like Israel, like countries like you know Kenya, countries you know in like uh, you know Nigeria. These are countries that realize that their diaspora are the base for the economic growth. Mm. And I think that these are people God has helped us to be Josephs in Egypt, whatever the country is called, and, you know, do things in our favor at the end of the day. So for me, I have never had any contradiction in my mind mm. to understand how significant, like I said during the campaign, I said, actually, I would, I would confer ambassadorship on every Zambian that is doing something useful outside the country. Because at the end of the day, they are our ambassadors. Even when you meet amongst yourselves, they ask you, hey, come, brother, where are you from? I'm from Zambia. You are representing already. So we yes. cannot exclude you from the opportunities that exist in Zambia. So that's a broad answer. I've not gone into specifics, but I would not treat them any different from the Zambians that are here in terms of opportunities. Okay. The next question is from Dr. Monsanje. He says, good morning, Dr. Mumba. Do you think Zambians in diaspora will vote in 2026? If not, please give guidance. Well, there is a um, positive, uh, positive discussion going on right now. And by the way, Elliot, how are you? Um, Elliot is a, is a Hillcrest guy, so we, it's good to know he's still out there doing the right thing. Um, there is a lot of positive talk about um, uh, making sure that the diaspora vote in 2026. I have no reason to doubt uh, that mm. it's going to happen if we continue on the trajectory we are on. Uh, the registration uh, of voters is starting, which is going to, you know, a census is going to start. Um, then we're going to have a voters registration. And uh, during that time, we are going to hopefully incorporate how we get the diaspora to start to vote. Uh, that discussion is already on the table. In fact, it has already been announced uh, by government. So one would like to hope that by 2026, the process would be in place. Okay. Dr. Mumba, you you did allude to a memorial service uh, which took place yesterday of uh, first Republican president, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda. And uh, also, unfortunately, two days ago, we lost another freedom fighter, um, Mr. Sikota Wiener. And uh, may you so rest in peace and uh, condolences to the Wiener family. Mr. Scott Wiener is one of the people that appeared on this show in our early days. The reason I raised those two names, Dr. Kaunda and uh, Mr. Wiener, is are we doing enough to preserve the legacy and the history of our freedom fighters? I, I, how, how, are you, how do you look at that? Because I, was, I even asked a question, Dr. Mumba, to a friend. I said, I don't know how many of these are remaining, apart from VJ. Although VJ was the youngest in the, in the bunch, are we doing enough to preserve the legacy and history of these freedom fighters? Um, Panji Kaunda said something extremely significant yesterday when he gave uh, a statement concerning his father the tribute to his father. Mm. He had mentioned that, look, these guys who are dying, they are going. They are not coming back. And we have not been very good at preserving history as a people and taking advantage of these people to really either do it in books or have some kind of uh, gallery where we can keep this information for our future generation. He went on further to say that a country that does not understand its history is a lost country, mm -hmm. and the future can be manipulated by anybody. And I agree with him. And I think I've been saying this for some time now. Uh, I've been concerned not only about the preservation of the history of our country, but also on the you know, preservation of, of the freedom fighters themselves, uh, their mm -hmm. well-being. 
uh, when I was vice president, I raised this issue in cabinet that, you know, except Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, all the other freedom fighters who served in the first cabinet and government, government had no obligation to them. They, they yeah. became robbers. They, it's, it's a terrible thing to see um, how the end of our freedom fighters looks like. You, it, it will break your heart. We have no program for them. We don't consider them, but we sing praises for them when they die. But if you go to their homes and look at how they live, um, we have not really invested anything in them. In the United States of America, you have the issue of the, young, the veterans who come from war and how they are looked after, how they are revered as people that have really laid down their lives for their country. It's that psyche of thinking about these freedom fighters that we need to do. And we are urging the new government that this is something that the European D must consider. They don't have many former freedom fighters left. So mm -hmm. the ones that are left are not that many that they cannot be looked after in one way or the other. But I think we need to do that. So I agree with you, we can improve on this and we must improve on it. We must make sure that first of all, we preserve the history uh, mm -hmm. so that you guys, the, the, you know, the, the Mashonga guys, as they grow, they can, you know, tell their own story confidently. Because when you're in New York and they're telling you their story, you go to, to China, they tell you their, your story. If you don't have your own story, you become subjected to them. And that is why I think that that question is important. And I think government officials are listening. I think President Hagai Nechlema is listening because he commented, he commented on this yesterday after uh, Mr. Kaunda uh, Panji said what he said, that he was mm. going to look into. Excellent. You say there's a press conference coming up. Do you have a date already or we need to wait for the announcement? You wait for the announcement. Um, we will be announcing soon. And uh, I think it's a press conference everybody should listen to. Okay. Every person has a day when he talks to the nation. And I think that would be my day. I have not talked for a reason, and I will talk. All right. We shall be looking out for that announcement. Everybody look out for that announcement. I believe some uh, important things will be addressed and uh, announced by Dr. Mumba president for movement for multi-party democracy sir we do thank you it's always good to have you on and thank you for sharing your thoughts with us thank you nathan um just to imagine that you guys are still going so many years later i was one of your first um uh you know guests and yes your resilience is amazing i, I thought you guys were throwing the towel after so many years here you are congratulations and keep going Thank you, sir. We do appreciate that. 14 years strong, and uh, because of your support, your believing in us, and always being there for us when we call upon you, you do show up and give us some uh, enlightening uh, information and discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our discussion coming up. Don't go away. We'll be going to Lusaka, Zambia again. We'll be talking to uh, some participants, amazing Zambians who will be participating and the conference, Dr. Mumba, coming up in Livingstone, I believe in two weeks' time, uh, Zambian Diaspora Conference. All right, everybody, stand by. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, Mr. Mashonga, you still awake? You still alive? <laughs> still alive. <laughs> All right. We are going to Lusaka again, although I didn't ask where my next guests are based. I'm assuming they are in Lusaka. That's always not a very good thing to assume. But uh, <laughs> Zambia Diaspora Conference coming up in Livingstone, uh, May, July 6th to the 8th. 
changing mindsets to bring about change is what our discussion is going to be. And joining us is Miss Rose CBC. Hello. Hi, how are you doing, Nathan? How are you? How are you? I'm looking forward to this uh, 150 minutes discussion. I tell you, <laughs> 150 no. minutes indeed. Hi, Kasuba. It's only 15 Hi. minutes. Hi. And how also, one Zambia celebrated diasporans and uh, athlete, Mr. Samuel Matete. Ba Matete, Murishan. <laughs> Mr. Matete, you need to put your video on and let us know when you are ready. We shall go straight into it here with me. Miss Rose, welcome. It's good to have you on here. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, I'm super excited. yes, yes. Um, you lived in the diaspora yourself for quite a number of years. And did. you did some phenomenal things. You... Uh, you've worked very hard to be where you are, what you have done, the companies that you have established, brand names of things. How did you get to that place where you said, you know what, I'm packing up my suitcases and I'm heading back? Um, it's Thank you so much for that. Um, it, it's one of those uh, personal convictions that you tend to get, because if you yes. get an opportunity, as we've had, where you can go to another country and uh, stay there for some time, you start learning new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things. I was right next door for 17 years, actually. Uh, oh, wow. I was based in South Africa for 17 years, and I decided to come back home about four years ago, about 2017. But even before I, I came back officially, I was still like really spending a lot of time because of the benefit of the short distance. So even though I was away, I was always in and out. So one starts seeing opportunities where you have uh, a chance to be able to make a difference in your hometown. Because what, what happens when you're in the diaspora is mm. that no matter how hard you work, no matter how long you stay there, there's always that inborn thing where you know that my home, my birth home is not here. So there's always something that sort of wants to tag back at you. So for me, it was um, after 20 odd years, 25 actually years of corporate wow. experience, yeah working for eight different multinationals, learning from very different dynamics. I mean, you learn from the Germans, you learn from the Japanese, you learn from the British, and you learn from the South Africans as well. That combination, a little bit of this here and there, then allows you to broaden your mind and start thinking big. For example, for me, when you relate to the businesses that you're talking about, mm -hmm. I've always um, gravitated towards the media space and the media space coming from a place where I wanted to add my voice and how do I reach masses of people? So mm -hmm. I then established a TV talk show. And okay. then I realized with the TV talk show, you only can speak to a certain number of people at a particular time. Like right now, Nathan, you're only able to speak to two of us and you're breaking us up in, you know, in intervals. So then yes. I decided... Why settle for just a TV talk show that only allows you to speak to 15 people every three months? Why not go for a whole 24-hour broadcasting station? And then I decided, but if I wanted to do that, where would I do it? I'm going to establish it back home. So there that was my go. motivation of coming back home and said, let me start a platform that mm. allows us to have our voices and share our experiences in the big world out there and see how we can improve our own country from the lessons that we've learned. So that's always been my biggest motivation. Wow, amazing. How did you find yourself involved, engaged, and how were you entangled in this Zambia Diaspora Conference? How did it happen? Well, because of the same, thank God for digital technology now. What happens, social media and digital technology allows you to connect with different people. So via uh -huh. LinkedIn, via Twitter, and all these blogs, you start getting to, to meet people who you haven't met before, but through the social media platforms, it's like you've known them. So eventually that's how via via networks and references and all that I got to know of Dr. Frida Brazel. And okay. we got talking and we found that we had a passion and a desire for something similar, like how can we bring diaspora experiences back home and see how we can use that to shift mindsets? Because even in our own country, in our own language, Nathan, you see what I mean? Ben, my prophet says that as long as you are just limited to your mother's cooking in your mother's house, it's uh -huh. very difficult for you to be able to appreciate somebody else's cooking and the different variety of dishes that are out there. 
So in speaking to people like Dr. Frida Brazel, who's the founder of this amazing initiative, and also her inclusive aspect of bringing teens and like-minded people together is how we found ourselves working towards this fantastic, life-changing conference that's coming up in Livingston in, uh, in two weeks' time. So I'm super amped and I'm super excited to hear from experiences. We have to continue learning. We have to continue listening from others. You, you're never too old to learn. And also as a young person, don't close yourself up. Think outside the box. I think Zambia has got what it takes. It's one of the fastest, it has an opportunity to be one of the fastest growing economies just based on creativity and the ability of people to think outside the box. And that's the agenda we want to push in shifting mm. the mindsets. Kasulova, before you jump in, let's see if we can get Mr. Matete here. Vasam. Hey, quad camera, Vasam. <laughs> well, Sam, we need to talk to these gallant Zambians. Please keep trying and we shall yes. see if we can connect you here. Kasulwa, go ahead. Okay. Hi again, Madam Rose. Hi, Kasulwa. Okay, great to have you. Um, I'd like Thank to take you back just welcome. I'd like to take you back just a bit. Um you you talked of from uh, coming up with a media company that uh, runs 24-7. Mm -hmm. Was it something, were you in media um, in Nessie as well? And then what's the name of the media company for the sake of the viewers that you are running here in Zambia? Okay, so two parts. Um, the media broadcasting TV station that we launched last year is called Maluba TV. Uh, it is uh, the first 24-hour women-inspired channel that seeks to advocate for the inclusion of women in all spheres of society and showcase and highlight the value that they bring and how we can use the beauty and the nurturing power of women to influence our nations and our economies. In South Africa, no, I wasn't running the media company, but through the work and the different profiles that I heard in the corporate space, they always expected um there was always an element of pr and communication and it's it's a combination of your natural character your personality and your build you probably can tell i talk a lot it's my gift it's i'm easy to, i easily communicate so i was like how can i use this gift that i have to inspire and to impact others and that's where the desire came from and kasuluba you are right in asking that question because when it comes to media and being a media owner people assume that you have to have a journalistic background. Now, media in itself is a business. And again, that's the mindset that we need to shift. To be mm -hmm. in the media space as a business owner, it doesn't mean that you have to have had background in journalism. It's natural for me. It's inborn. And of course, it's something I've been studying on the side, in the background, just for the clout of it. But the natural aspect and the approach that I've taken with the media platform that I've created is that it's a business. My strengths are in business reorganization, establishing business systems and processes, as well as bringing people together. And that's the strength that I leverage off in creating uh, Maluba TV, which is born out of a series of talk shows called Star Wars Roses TV talk show that has now evolved into a 24-hour platform. And it's still in the in the early, early stages. We just got our license last year. We're still putting our infrastructure, our equipment, and all of that together before we can get to the stage that we can we can become like Ebony Life TV Harpo mm. Studios, Tyler Perry in Hollywood. Hello. Yes, why not, yeah, Barros? <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 All right. Let's That's say hello to Mr. Matete before we talk about we we just dive into the conference. Mr. Matete, hello. Okay. I think uh well, Sam. Yeah, I think yeah. there's some connectivity problems, but Nathan yeah. and Kasuba, I must mention that I was a huge fan of, of Samuel Matete. I'm copper belt bred, so I was born and bred in Chingola. So you know, like every oh so once Mulivena Kasum Pebon say. So when Samuel my wife comes, comes my wife comes from Chingola too. <laughs> right, yes. Whatever Samuel Giraffe. <laughs> so I am just so excited to have him here today. It's it's going to be an exciting time. Let's dive into the conference, Varos, as we wind up. It looks like Mr. Matete is not able to join us. We can try to do this with him next weekend. I mean, this is a okay. gallant son who represented Zambia at the highest oh. athletic level. And I mean, I mean, you, they, they, what 
is your expectation? You are speaking at the conference. What are your expectations? Why should somebody jump on a plane, a bus, and come to Livingstone? So my expectations are huge. And even this, um, what you've just said about Samuel, the whole reason that everybody should come to this conference and participate is that we have to sing and 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 blow our own trumpets. If you look at a mm. Samuel Mateo, we've got so many unsung heroes, gallant souls of sons of the soil. Don't wait for someone to die before you start talking about their contribution. There so you when go. you look at the conference, these are the things that we want to talk about, especially post-COVID. It has taught us that the borders are open. There's mm. nothing like just you operating in your space in your own country. So what I'm looking forward to, I mean, the phenomenal lineup of speakers that is there and the topics that we'll be talking about, the whole new buzz is how can we transform our homegrown African economies into the Africa we want? And we are yes. saying with this conference, this, the Zambia Diaspora Conference is saying, how are we going to tap into the value that Zambians have in the diaspora and bring it back home? I mean, Nathan, you know. If you look at, I mean, we've got top achieving Zambians at NASA, at Boeing. And the, and this is also, Kasulua, some inspiration that allowed mm. me to create this platform that we have to, yeah. you know, highlight yeah. the achievement that Zambians are doing. And this conference promises to do that. If you look at the people that are going to be there, Yokalu Shabwalia, I mean, everybody's just like, oh, no, he's a striker. Is this, that is, he's the greatest footballer that ever existed. Oh, and yes. Zambians claim that. We need to claim our space. And this is what we're saying for generations to come we've had in our time our children going to stay in different countries and why must there always be that notion that other countries are better than zambia we are good enough we are well equipped we're well endowed with resources that come from the diaspora and we're saying if zambians in the diaspora are changing the world and coming up with mm. scientific solutions for a whole nasa why can't we do it back home why are exactly. we always complaining things that are not working when we should be the ones fixing ourselves and that's my expectations my Excellent. expectation when we go to the conference it's like solutions not just talk where mm. we get together and it's a summit and it's a tick in the box as we've been talking with the visionary the organizing committee we're very clear that the results based outcome of this conference is execution ideas and and change change mindsets that are going to happen in every sphere of society. So you'll see that even the people that are participating are represented from the private and the public sector. No, and sorry. once those minds are put together, Zambia can be the next Singapore, the next Rwanda. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't emerge the strongest economy in, in the world. It definitely shall be. It definitely shall be. Well, Miss Rose, thank you for taking the time, everybody. The, the, the conference is in Livingstone, Zambia, July 6th to the 8th, and the yeah. website is crawling at the bottom there. You can look at all the information that is needed. Oh, by the way, Miss Rose uh, Kasulova will be there, so you're going to meet him in person. We are sending him. We are sending this we are, we are sponsoring Kasulova. <laughs> Yeah, it would be lovely to see you. We're we're definitely geared. We're definitely excited. Um, the president himself will be there. The chief marketing officer. He's been talking about <laughs> how Zambia I like that. I like that he calls himself chief Zambia marketing officer. <laughs> exactly. So we are the sales and marketing team that will be supporting uh, all of those that would like to market Zambia, and that's what we intend to do. So we're very excited about that. So uh, please, it's not too late. Allow people to sign up, buy those tickets. Livingston is getting fully booked out, so you better yes, run. Yes, you better you run. Week. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Rose. Looking forward to seeing you and everybody. That was our show for today. Join us next weekend. We'll be talking Bitcoin and the cybersecurity. And also, we'll be having some two uh, key not uh, representatives or participants into the Zambian Diaspora Conference. Mr. K, thank you, Miss Rose, everybody. We do thank Dr. Thank Mumba you. for taking the time to be with us. Have a great weekend. Thank you. I bring you greetings from College Station, Texas. My name is Dr. Henry Kasonde Musoma. I am so, so very excited to invite you to the first, I mean, the first ever Shifting Mindsets to Ignite Growth Conference in Livingston, Zambia. This will be held from July 6th to July 8th. Please go to shiftingmindset.org and sign up. We look forward 
We look forward to make the waters thunder. Masutunya. See you soon. Zambia Block Talk Radio. 